it's great to be here today and I'm really delighted to um, introduce um, Jennifer Coates. Several of us were looking forward to meeting Jennifer in person earlier this year in ICDAM, which is the major dietary assessment methods conference, um, which was due to meet in May, but of course with the world situation of COVID um, was, was cancelled. Um, so it is a, a pleasure to be able to welcome Jennifer to give this um, talk over Zoom, the way of the world nowadays. Um, Jennifer Coates is an Associate Professor of Food Policy and Applied Nutrition at Tufts, um, Frieden School of Nutrition Science and Policy. And she will be talking today, as you can see, on Index 24, um, which is an innovative global dietary assessment platform um, aimed at increasing access, accessibility to dietary assessment measurement and availability and use of dietary data. Um, Jennifer, her research focuses on a wide variety of things, development of methods, evaluation of international nutrition and food security programs. She works to develop metrics, novel metrics and tools, um, including related to, across dietary assessment and food security, and particularly for use in low and middle income countries. We share many interests and goals with Jennifer's group, and in the dietary assessment team there's many parallels with our own work on Intake24, which many of you listening in today will be um, familiar with. This is the UK web-based dietary assessment tool, initially developed by the University of Newcastle, and we have been working with Newcastle to implement this into our UK National Diet and Nutrition Survey. It also has global relevance and has been implemented in a number of countries, and it will be really interesting to hear um, comparisons and differences in the approach on Index24 We've been developing um, Intake24 for implementation in South Asia and have had some great conversations over recent months with Jennifer and her colleagues. Um, so it's my great pleasure to hand over to Jennifer for her talk today. Um, and if you have questions, as Bridget's explained, do um, note these in the chat and we'll be ready to have that discussion. So over to you, Jennifer. Thank you and welcome. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Polly, and, and thank you to my colleagues in um, the CEDAR MRC EPI unit. Um, it's a really a great pleasure to be able to join you this morning from Boston um, and to be able to have the chance to share some of the, the progress that we've been making on um, developing Index 24, which I will explain more about today in my talk. Um, and also really looking forward to the opportunity to hear questions from this group and to be able to, to have a dialogue at the end of this presentation. So, so thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> so uh, just to give you a brief outline of, of what I'm planning to cover today. So just to spend a couple minutes introducing you to the, the overall index project, which, which has a mandate that kind of exceeds its focus on this development of the index 24 platform. Um, we'll cover some of the, the challenges that, that we have seen in low and middle income countries related to dietary data assessment. Um, and then I'll give you an overview of Index 24. Um, unfortunately, the time is too short today to give you a, a demo of the actual tools, but that's something that um, we can always arrange for the future if, if anyone is interested. Um, and then um, I'll, I'll talk very briefly about the validation study that we uh, engaged in back in the fall and for which we are still analyzing our results. Um, so I won't be able to present a, a complete picture of results today. And then I'll touch on some of the next steps with Index 24 and our plans for the next couple of years. So um, the index uh, project is the International Dietary Data Expansion Project. And um, it began in 2015. Uh, initially, it was a five-year program that was, uh, and still is, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And we've recently received um, additional funding for another two years to continue the, the efforts that we began in 2015. Now, the overall objectives of index are to improve the availability and the access and use of dietary data in low and middle income countries. And so even though we have been focused on a number of different ways to do that um, and a number of different types of dietary data, including um, data that can be derived at the household level from households consumption and expenditure surveys, 
um, as well as kind of quick and quick and dirty dietary diversity in these indices. One of the main thrusts of our project has really been to um, focus on the the improving the collection of quantitative dietary data, specifically 24 hour recall data. And um, the way that we've tackled this is to think about identifying the number of different bottlenecks that exist right now in low and middle income countries with regard to um, uh, the, the challenges um, that countries go through in order to try to collect and use dietary data and to, to try to identify approaches to breaking down those bottlenecks. And so one of the approaches that I'm gonna focus on today for this talk is, um, is Index 24, which is this technology to help to standardize and streamline the collection and analysis of individual dietary data. So some of you may be all too familiar with um, some of the, the many different kinds of challenges involved in collecting dietary data. And I would say that a lot of these challenges exist both in um, upper income countries as well as in low and middle income countries. But the challenges are accentuated um, even more so in countries that have had traditionally limited resources to be able to put toward um, the, 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 the effort of dietary data collection. So one of the challenges um, and one of the reasons why I guess resources are limited is that the, the resource demands, um, at least initially upfront for collecting dietary data are, are pretty um, great. Um, in, in some ways they, they are no greater than um, the resources that are required for any large scale survey. Um, conducted at an individual or household level. Um, on the other hand, there are a whole slew of reasons why um, dietary data collection can be more expensive, um, particularly, as I said, the very first time it's done. And one of the reasons for that is um, the need for a special set of what we call it within the index project dietary data inputs. Now that involves things like up-to-date food lists and food composition data, um, food composition data, kind of being able to um, display the nutrient values of the different foods that were co are collected in order to be able to transform that information into um, nutrient con constituents and calculate um, indicators of nutrient intake and adequacy. Um, other things like portion conversion factors and standard recipes and yield factors and a whole number of different things that are specific to, largely specific to the foods that are indigenous to a particular country context. And so what that means is that it's actually very difficult to um, share that information from one country to the next because it doesn't necessarily apply. Um, and so those inputs um, ideally need to be created and invested in over time and maintained. And this is an area that, um, that uh, low and middle income countries have struggled with. So in addition to that, you know, we face uh, in LMICs also kind of the technical and methodological challenges that come with implementing what is a very, very technical method of collecting dietary data. So this, among other things, this combination of factors really has played a big role in limiting the degree to which low and middle income countries have invested in the routine collection of large scale national level dietary data in the past. Now, um, before I talk about this slide, I think what, one thing that is important to mention is that we have been uh, seeing a paradigm shift, however, over the last several years and when we began the index project, we were just um, on the cusp of that paradigm shift. Momentum had been building from various corners of the international uh, nutrition and also agriculture communities. Um, and that momentum was really uh, this growing recognition of the critical importance of having very um, rigorously collected, um, relatively up-to-date dietary data in order to be able to address issues related to the global burden of malnutrition, 
both underweight and obesity occurring simultaneously in many cases within a country or even a household or an individual. Um, <clears throat> also from the ag sector, um, a, a real interest in dietary data to be able to understand what consumers were consuming and demanding and how agriculture could rise to the occasion and be able to supply the kinds of nutritious foods that perhaps uh, consumers would like to have more of. Um, we also saw a lot of interest coming from the food safety sector in, in being able to have better dietary information to be able to calculate um, uh, risks of various sorts related to um, a whole host of food safety related issues. And so um, there were a number of very high level calls for um, improved dietary data collection globally. That includes calls that were issued in the Global Nutrition Report, um, reports by the Global Panel of Experts. Um, so coming from a whole number of different sectors that I think really have converged to, to make this a very ripe time to be able to think about investing in global scale up of dietary data assessment. So index 24 was fortunate enough to, to come on, uh, sorry, index was fortunate enough to come on the scene at a time when um, the, the, the groundwork I would say had been laid and there was a very positive um, receptiveness internationally for this kind of effort. Now, how did we go about um, the development of index 24? Um, each of these uh, bubbles in this funnel that you'll see Really, I could talk about for quite a long time, but um, suffice it to say that we went through a very systematic process that event, uh, originally began with uh, a very comprehensive landscape assessment, um, initially to look at both what were the existing systems in upper, middle, up, upper income countries as well as low and middle income countries um, that relied on uh, computer-based approaches to assessing 24-hour recall, whether it was an individual, um, individually administered or enumerator administered. And at the same time, um, we also focused in on, uh, as part of our landscape assessment, on the um, whole slew of innovative initiatives that are still occurring um, and under development for seeking to find better ways of collecting dietary data that don't rely necessarily on self-report. Um, and through the end of that pretty complex assessment, one of the things that we concluded was that, that none of the very, um, I would say kind of sexier innovative approaches to using things like cameras and other types of imaging were really ready for prime time so to speak, and particularly not in a, in a low and middle income country context, which I know is a very a vast landscape that I'm referring to, but um, has a number of things in common related to often um, uh, challenges with literacy levels, um, which would prevent people from being able to administer um, some of these things themselves, challenges still with connectivity and other types of challenges that um, that meant that none of the more innovative methods were quite appropriate just yet. So based on a combination of global expert input, um, intensive discussions within our own technical advisory group, um, input from our country partners in Burkina Faso and in Vietnam, um, as well as um, other technical experts who were involved in the process, we, we produced a set of technical specifications for Index 24. And that really was just the starting point not the end point as we had expected. <laughs> um, we also conducted uh, some very, um, I would say pretty widespread consultations with our two partner countries, one in Burkina Faso, um, another in Vietnam, um, with part in partnership with the National Institute of Nutrition there. And one of the things that was very helpful that emerged from these uh, multi-day workshops that we held with a whole range of stakeholders from from different sectors in each of these countries was that there really was a very strong demand, very clearly articulated interest in um, having access to better dietary data. Um, not all the sectors were interested in taking on the burden of actually um, being responsible for collecting it, which was fine. Um, but there were, there were a whole number of um, 
of different needs that were articulated very clearly. And what one could see after we had a sense going into this, but it was confirmed coming out of the other end of, of the workshops in at least these two countries, um, in addition to one in Bangladesh, um, was that you know really diet um, plays such a critical role at the nexus of nutrition and health, of agriculture and also environmental sustainability, that um, a lack of data in that central circle really makes it difficult to connect the dots um, between these other important three spheres. So there were a number of um, uh, interests that were shared from this group, and this is just a short list of some of the things that emerged from those discussions, um, including inclu informing food safety, being able to track the effects of, of dietary change on non-communicable diseases, being able to monitor national food policies, um, better understanding links between production and consumption, understanding you know, individual level, <clears throat> really disaggregated by age and sex, uh, the dietary intakes, understanding sustainability implications, um, specific kinds of programming that really require dietary data at different points in the program cycle, including fortification programs, um, being able to track progress towards um, sustainable development goals, um, a, whole, a whole number of other types of types of interest that emerged from this group. And it was a very valuable discussion because through this process, we were also able to pinpoint um, and kind of uh, ground truth some of the things that, some of the needs that we had suspected were important going into these workshops, but then uh, were reconfirmed in that discussion. And so through this, this process and this, this process of also the broader expert consultation with, with other experts globally, uh, we we kind of honed the, the needs. Um, one of the one of the ones that really emerged was the need for a platform that would help to prevent reinventing the wheel with each new survey. And so what I mean by that is that um, kind of typical practice or standard practice in a lot of countries was um, both by kind of governments at the national level, but also by individual researchers who are attempting to to conduct dietary related research in a given country would be to kind of uh, scramble around every time a, a survey was planned um, in order to be able to try to pull together these inputs that I mentioned in the beginning, um, be able to be able to create a new questionnaire um, that would be able to um, walk people through the 24 hour recall process. And, um, and, and, and in other words, get everything in place which is such a huge upfront investment that it was actually in many cases prohibitive um, and, and a large enough um, co cost and uh, perception of time involved in this approach that it meant that um, many would actually just give up on the process before even beginning. So it was seen as being very important to, to help these countries prevent having to reinvent the wheel every time they thought about doing a new survey. And Coming at this from a global perspective, um, it was important to be able to develop tools that could enable adaptability across a very wide range of contexts. So, you know, the, as you saw, the two countries that we worked with closely were Vietnam and Burkina Faso. They have very different food systems, um, very different food ways. And as part of that, uh, and in addition to that, um, there are many other contextual factors that affect how one would approach um, the collection of dietary data, including um, the, the modes of eating from a common pot um, or eating um, from a common plate with chopsticks. And <clears throat> those types of things had to be taken into account in order for a global platform to potentially succeed. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing that kind of relates to reinventing the wheel but is maybe a little bit different, um, is, is this interest in really trying to standardize the data collection approaches according to global best practice. So what that entailed was first identifying global best practice and, um, and then trying to develop the tools that could reflect those best practices while also taking into account the need for certain types of adaptation for context. And we also heard loud and clear the fact that um, in many cases, countries became tripped up at the stage of data processing and analysis. Partly this was due to um, 
not having complete dietary inputs, so not having complete food consumption data, uh, sorry, food cons composition data, um, or some of the other factors that are needed in order to be able to process and, and output useful information. And also sometimes it was due to, um, you know, a lack of familiarity with the 24 hour recall method and some of the technical um, aspects or highly technical aspects that were challenging for individual researchers and country governments to grapple with. So we wanted to make sure that we built into these tools something that would enable that the whole um, data value chain from collection to uh, output of indicators. And we hope that through all of this, we would ultimately be shortening the time and cost required to launch a dietary survey, produce useful dietary data, as well as, you know, um, increasing the accuracy of the results over the kind of standard of practice, which in many countries was still using a pen and paper method. So um, from these needs, we had, uh, I'll just go into a little bit more detail about the specifications. So um, we determined that it would be important to have something that could be collected using a tablet so that it would be um, uh, portable for use in remote locations that didn't necessarily have electrical connection. Um, <clears throat> we decided to use the multiple pass 24 hour recall as a uh, globally accepted standard. We also um, wanted to make sure that the, the tablets and all of the other uh, components of the system could operate offline. Um, due to literacy constraints, we determined that this needed to be interviewer administered, uh, had to be contextually adaptable, as I've mentioned. We wanted it to make sure that it would link automatically to food comp composition databases and other kinds of inputs. Um, it, it should be useful not just for small scale surveys, but also scalable for use in national surveys. Ideally easy to use. Um, in some ways, that's the most challenging thing of all. Um, relatively low cost to adapt, and we wanted to have something that was based on open source code so that um, it could be as accessible as possible. So this is just to illustrate um, a couple of the publications that came out of this upfront work that we did. Um, one which really reflected the, the landscape assessment and another which reflected a description of the specifications for index 24. So feel free to read more about it if you'd like. So now I'm going to move on to talk a little bit in more detail about the index 24 platform. Um, this is a, a schematic that that lays out the, um, the different components of the platform. And I'm going to talk about each one in a little bit more detail. So um, the first one that you see here is um, what I'll refer to in shorthand as the web app. Um, and, I'll, and I'll tell you about it more in a second, but just to give you an overview, the web app and all of the, all of the detailed um, dietary input data that are housed in this cloud-based repository um, feed then kind of uh, directly into the um, mobile app. And the mobile app is the thing that the enumerators would have in hand when they go to the field in order to be able to collect the dietary data. Um, and so by tailoring and customizing the details um, for a particular country context in the web app, it, those data can be pushed to the mobile app and then enumerators would see on their version of the index 24 software um, a customized country specific um, piece of software that's ready to go for their for their job in the field. Um, once the data are collected, the data are um, processed uh, and in in that uh, phase of processing, there are, are a number of different analytical reports that we've created. Some of them include different kinds of gaps reports that will help the researchers to identify where the gaps remain. For instance, if uh, food was reported in during the data collection period um, that doesn't already exist in the web app, then the gaps report would identify that and identify it and also highlight the need to be able to um, locate appropriate food composition data um, yeah, in order to be able to process the full data set uh, to derive the nutrient values and nutrient intakes. So um, <clears throat> out the other end, one could either export a raw data set, cut entirely raw with all of the original data as, as reported, or one could use these analytical reporting features to have a more customized and tailored 
um, set of output to both guide the processing and also to view a range of different kinds of indicators. So in just a little bit more detail, so the web app is um, a centralized and accessible, publicly accessible, not just yet, but it will be, um, repository of dietary data inputs. And it links seamlessly with the mobile app. And the other kind of um, vision that we have for the web app is to be able to enable sharing of these different kinds of dietary inputs among users. And so, for instance, um, we created a comprehensive set of dietary inputs for Vietnam and for Burkina Faso. And uh, we expect then that in the future, once we make these data publicly available through the um, Index24 web app, that someone else who comes along who would like to be able to implement a survey in Burkina Faso or in Vietnam would be able to copy our workspace and use that as their starting point and maybe their endpoint. Maybe they don't even need to augment much what we have already done. So that is really um, one of the key ways in which we hope to decrease the amount of time and effort that goes in upfront to preparing for a dietary survey and also to be able to um, decrease the amount of time required to process and use um, food consumption results. So then a few more um, features of the mobile app. So as I mentioned, it collects the 24-hour recall data on a tablet or a smartphone. It's administer, it, it administered by enumerators. Um, we use the multi-pass method. It's available for use offline, can be customized in a number of different ways, both through the web app and also directly. So for instance, one can change the, the language um, in which data are collected. Um, we can change the help and hint text to customize that for a particular context. So there are a number of different features that can be customized while still remaining within a kind of general standardized format. And then finally, these analytical reports produce a range of summary statistics, including by nutrient, by food group, um, and allowing for a, a different, different kinds of data exports. So within the, the Index24 web app, we have, um, sorry, like maybe a little bit hard to see on your screen, but um, the, the food composition tab allows for um, the hosting of up to 152 different nutrient components for a given food. Um, it also, it doesn't require, but encourages that foods be coded with Foodex2, which is a global food categorization system that is meant to um, allow one to understand from one context to another whether we're actually talking about the same food. So developed a, a, a common vocabulary about how we refer to the same kinds of food. And so Foodex2 is something that's been adopted by the Food and Agriculture Organization. It also originated um, within EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority. And um, we're encouraging the use of Foodex2 within Index24 to be able to support ultimately data harmonization. Within the recipes tab, um, one can include lists of recipes, ingredients, and ingredient proportions. Um, we have a food descriptors tab, which we also call the tags table. And this is a list of descriptors that are associated with each food that are used to elicit and then characterize attributes of the food item. Um, and once those are developed in the web app and pushed to the mobile app, enumerators will see them pop up as probes to be able to use in the 24 hour recall survey. So if somebody said they consumed milk, um, then uh, a logical set of questions to follow that would be, you know, what kind of milk? Was it cow milk? Was it camel milk? Um, and then another question might be, you know, what, what percentage of fat was in that milk? So those are the kinds of probes that I mean, and those would all appear and be prepared in advance in the um, food descriptors table. And then finally, we have a conversion, portion conversions table, which um, includes conversion factors to be able to convert from the units in which the, re the um, respondents report having consumed those foods into gram weight equivalents um, to be able to analyze later on. Um, includes information on edible portions, and densities, um, and a number of different things that are important to be able to convert that information. So um, I'm just going to go through this quickly because I've touched on a lot of these, but some of these um, features are worth highlighting. 
So as I mentioned before, um, we envision that the web app will remain an open access platform, meaning that um, anybody will be able to, to use it for free, store their dietary input data there, um, and that eventually this will grow to become a, a global centralized space for this type of food reference data. Um, in the meantime, individual users can create workspaces for their own surveys. Um, they have the flexibility to be able to set their workspace to either private, um, read-only, meaning that um, other users can come on and see that something exists for Bangladesh. They might not be able to access the data um, in the Bangladesh workspace, but they'll have access to the metadata and be able to contact the data owners to request permission to use those data. And then it's also possible, and we encourage, um, being able to set a workspace to public, which enables anybody to come in, see the data that are there, and um, copy and paste them into their own new workspace. It also has features that enable users to be able to search for and copy country-specific di uh, dietary data inputs. Um, and the purpose of that is you know, to be able to say, OK, I'm working in Senegal. I see that there is a very complete and comprehensive set of inputs from Burkina Faso. Um, you know, some of the foods are very similar. Let me see whether there's information in the Burkina Faso database that would be helpful for my survey. Um, and as long as those data in Burkina Faso are public, then the user could go in and copy and bring them into their own workspace. And this is something that um, was very important to be able to either allow the, the management of these data in the database to occur online through the cloud-based repository or in Excel so that users could opt to work primarily in Excel, especially when there isn't a very fast uh, internet connection, which is the case in many countries still. Um, we also built this so that the food and recipe names for a given workspace can be translated in up to four different languages. So this would be the case in say Nigeria where we're working now, where we have to, we're concerned about um, uh, enabling enumerators to be able to administer the survey in a number of different languages. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, let's see, I'm gonna just skip some of these in the interest of time. You can take a look and I've mentioned some of these already. Um, and then with the mobile app, um, a couple more features worth highlighting. So, um, the, you know, we've designed it as I, as I think is best practice with a lot of the 24 hour recall um, software that's out there to allow for repeat recalls, um, knowing that it's, you know, usually uh, recommended for recalls to be done at least at least two to three times on non consecutive days in order to be able to get a better picture of usual intake. And so the repeat recalls can still be linked back to a specific respondent, so it can be used longitudinally. Um, I mentioned the probes that guide the interviewers across the survey process, um, and this is part of that standardization approach. So really kind of keeping that whole um, workflow for an enumerator relatively standard so that, that individual researchers or governments don't have to figure out how they want this to work every time they start a new survey. Um, we have features in there that allow for real-time data monitoring and also checking and review by the on-site supervisors, as well as the more intensive data monitoring that can be done by remote data managers um, who have access to a number of different kinds of um, statistics that they can view through the central platform, um, back, usually back in the capital city or in the headquarters. Now, um, we have some quality checks that are built in. Um, one of them is just having the instant calorie counts available for foods consumed and total energy values that are produced in summary form by at the end of the survey. Um, so that's one way that enumerators can kind of get a sense of whether something is really out of whack. And um, as I mentioned before, um, also on the mobile app as well as in the web app, um, the mobile app can accommodate up to four different survey languages at a time. So what that means is that even enumerators operating in an area where there's a diversity of languages spoken in the same area, the enumerators can toggle back and forth between and among the different languages. So the collected survey data are automatically uploaded to um, a very secure server 
Um, this was all built on this Calm Care platform that some may be familiar with. It's um, developed and run by a group called Demagi. Um, and uh, so as soon as there's an internet connection, all the data are uploaded and backed up. Um, we also have the flexibility for users to design and implement additional survey modules that could be administered alongside the dietary recall. So, you know, if you have other things that you want to know about um, people's food consumption or their physical activity or anything else that is of interest to that particular study, those modules can be designed in ComCare and then um, launched along with the dietary assessment portion. Okay, so <clears throat> I will um, now just talk very briefly about our validation study objectives. If this seminar had um, had been scheduled for say even three weeks from now, I would have detailed validation data to validation study data to be able to share with you. Um, unfortunately, we're in the, the final throes right now of analyzing our validation study results. And so um, most of it is not ready yet to be shared. So I apologize for that, but I'm gonna mention this because I think it's maybe helpful to see the, the kind of scientific process that we are taking with index 24 in ensuring that it actually is um, at least as accurate as a pen and paper method. So um, both in Burkina Faso and in Vietnam, um, the, the purpose of these validation study, this validation study is to assess the relative accuracy of the index 24 uh, CAPI method, which is the computer assisted personal interview method using um, the 24 hour recall compared with the standard of practice uh, paper, pen and paper interview modality. Um, we, uh, we recruited women into our sample and we compared the CAPI versus the PAPI against a weighed food record that was conducted the previous day as the benchmark of accuracy. Um, the second question for this validation study was to assess the total and also relative costs and cost effectiveness of being able to produce you know, uh, from A to Z, a clean and analyzable 24-hour recall data set with the index 24 CAPI tool compared to the more traditional CAPI approach. So we've broken everything down into cost centers um, that are the different kinds of time and cost related to each step of the dietary assessment process. And we're in the process of, we're also in the process of calculating um, all of the different costs and the cost effectiveness, which will actually be a cost per um, unit of relative accuracy gained from index 24 versus the PAPI. And then finally, um, the third main objective of this study was to be able to understand the user impressions of the ease of use, the usability of the index 24 CAPI compared with the PAPI modality that most of our enumerators were more accustomed to. So I'm only able to share some snapshots of the enumerator feedback um, at this point. So we have clearly a lot of quantitative results to be able to share at some point in the future. Um, for now, um, you know, the, the results of the feedback were largely positive with some caveats. So enumerators felt that um, in Vietnam, some expressed that uh, the biggest impression of index 24 is that it's fast. And when we finish, we don't have to go back and look for a lot of codes to do post-coding um, with standard recipes. That was something that they appreciated because they were able to see all of the ingredients at once and not have to actually collect the recipe ingredient by ingredient. Um, they felt that it made it easier to search for the exact foods. It's already matched with the food code. The data are already entered. This is a big advantage. Uh, they also felt that it could be more useful for reviewing and recapping the survey with the respondent at the end of the survey. Um, they felt, actually, it was interesting, um, some of the enumerators felt that it was, was kind of facilitated interaction with the respondents, whereas um, other enumerators felt that it was actually kind of inhibited their interaction with respondents. Partly because you know, they, the enumerators, felt like they had to look down at their tablets more than they would have if they had pen and paper in their hands. And also they found that the respondents were really interested in looking at the tablets too, because um, this was a novelty for, for many people. And so uh, having the enumerators kind of star staring at the tablet and the respondents staring at the tablet maybe impeded the rapport that would usually go hand in hand with this kind of survey. Um, 
Some found that it was faster except when there was a non-standard recipe encountered. And then in that case, this enumerator felt like it was easier to use the paper. For the tablet, there's a lot of kind of circular steps that need to be taken to collect the detailed data on a given recipe. And that was found to be very time consuming. So this other enumerator appreciated the way in which it guided the enumerators in, um, through the process and avoided some of these disadvantages. So I'm gonna go a little more quickly through, through the Burkina Faso results, but I will say that um, you know, a lot of the feedback was very similar. I think one of the, the things that really emerged from this was the need for good, strong training. Um, a lot of the enumerators felt that it was something that they could pick up but that it required training. It wasn't automatically intuitive. Um, and we understood that from the beginning, but I think it really became clear how much training is really important. So in my last minute here, and I, and I do need to wrap up, so we have time for, for Q&A, um, I just wanted to mention some of the challenges and limitations that we have encountered in going through this, this multi-year process of developing Index 24. Um, <clears throat> when we started this, we, we had the feeling that one of the biggest bottlenecks was this lack of um, kind of easy to use software for data collection in the field. And maybe that was naive, um, but what really became clear going through our process was that it is even more so the, um, the lack of good, strong, comprehensive and up-to-date dietary input data is, is a, even a more significant challenge. So under this next phase of our project that we're in now called Index Sustain, we are um, making a concerted push to try to scale up the data that um, are going to be available to users once we launch the Index 24 platform. We had envisioned that this would be something that um, you know, users would upload their own dietary input data and over time it would you know, accumulate in a cumulative fashion um, through a crowdsourced approach and, um, and become more robust over time. What we're realizing is that we do need to jumpstart that process and try to invest as much as possible in building out the global food reference repository. And so we have plans for this that are in the works, um, including uh, uh, in partnership with FAO. And we'd like to continue discussions with our colleagues there at, uh, here at Cambridge um, in order to see whether there are ways in which we might be able to join forces as well. So um, another takeaway is that, you know, index 24 makes dietary data collection easier, but it's still not a panacea. Um, if anybody has that magic bullet, I am so um, excited to hear about it because, you know, there still are steps, many steps that need to be taken in order to um, prepare for and launch a survey and analyze the data on the other end. And then finally, you know, one of the things that, um, our eyes were open to from the very beginning, but we're just really grappling with now is this question of sustainability and how we can um, responsibly sustain or kind of position index 24 in such a way that it can be sustained as a resource for the future. Um, <clears throat> so right now we're working to develop a plan for the public launch and scale up of index 24. And at the same time, we're working with a, um, a consultant who's um, helping us to develop a strategy that will ideally balance um, accessibility. We want it to be as accessible as possible because we don't want cost to be a barrier for um, global users. We, there are enough barriers already, um, but we also, you know, realistically will need to probably leverage some kind of a fee in order to be able to um, both satisfy our tech, tech partners um, subscription fee requirements and also to ensure the sustainability of this resource. Okay, so in terms of next steps, we are currently in this two-year phase um, of index. Um, we, we call it index sustain when we're talking very specifically about this phase of our project, but it's still under the index umbrella. Um, as I mentioned, we're in the process of completing our analysis of validation data from Burkina Faso and Vietnam. We are identifying and um, we are identifying early adopters. We're looking for up to a total of three early adopters who would be interested in partnering with us to try out the Index 24 platform in the context of a survey. Um, we are already paired up with Nigeria and supporting them in their national food consumption survey, which is in, in process and has been for some time. Um, but if any of you who are on the line 
feel like this is something that you might be interested in and you have a, a survey that you're intending to launch within the relatively near future, let's say the next six to six months or so, perhaps six to eight months, um, please feel free to be in touch with us because we would love to talk with you more about um, whether or not it would be a good fit for you to serve as an early adopter for Index 24. Um, we also are planning to make a big push on uh, scaling up what we're kind of sometimes referring to as the Global Food Reference Repository, otherwise known as our web app, um, building it out and really being starting to populate as quickly as possible the database with official food composition tables and other dietary input data. And then we intend to publicly launch Index 24 um, at the very end of 2020 or the very beginning of 2021. So stay tuned, it's coming soon. Um, I'd like to, to thank our entire index team, um, both the Boston-based team and also our partners at, at FAO, at IFPRI, um, in Burkina Faso and in Vietnam, as well as our tech partners, Demagi and Cactus. And um, thanks to you, the listeners, I'm, I'm very, well, uh, very open to any of the questions that you might have about this particular tool or about the efforts of index more broadly. So thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Jennifer. Really, really interesting.